And this is part three. We're in Psych 400 course pack, chapter 16, path analysis. Uh, chapter 16 is SEM1, path analysis with manifest variables. We're now up to part three. Part three is on page 11. And we're going to begin part three with this section that's headed initial theoretical model versus final preferred model. Uh, initial and alternative theoretical models. In a path analysis, researcher may refer to one causal model as the initial or primary theoretical model. This represents the researcher's best guess concerning the relationships that should exist based on his or her interpretation of theory and previous research prior to analyzing data from the current investigation. In the current study, model one from figure 16.2 is Dr. O'Day's primary theoretical model. Just to make sure we know what we're talking about. Going back to page 8, figure 16.2, if you focus on the model that consists only of the solid line arrows, that is model 1. And model 1 is her initial theoretical model, her primary theoretical model. Returning to page 11. Still on page 11, getting close to the bottom of it. Final preferred model. By the end of the analysis, researcher will arrive at a final preferred model. This is the investigator's best guess regarding the relationships between the variables based on the results obtained from the path analysis. We move on to page 12, results from the investigation. Uh, we're going to skip ahead a bit and see what kind of results Dr. O'Day got when she performed path analysis. I'm on page 13. 13, the section headed comparing the three path models. One of the most important things a researcher must do in path analysis involves determining whether the theoretical model displays an acceptable fit to the data. Conceptually, this means determining whether the causal relationships hypothesized by the theoretical model are feasible, given the correlational relationships that were actually observed in the real-world sample. A variety of different statistical results will guide the researcher in making this decision, uh, and the more important ones are described here. We skip down... We're on page 14, most of the way down page 14. The topic is Global Fit Indices, Basic Concepts. Uh, global Fit Indices. Wouldn't it be great if the computer could compute just one number, and this one number would indicate how well the researcher's theoretical model fits the data? Yes, it would be great, and we would call such a statistic a Global Fit Index. A single value that summarizes the overall fit between the theoretical path model and the data. Complicating matters is the fact that there's more than one way of defining fit of the theoretical model. This has led researchers to develop more than one global fit index. In fact, it's led researchers to develop many, many global fit indices. Further complicating matters is the fact that different indices may have dramatically different interpretations. Some of these indices, such as the GFI, the NFI, the NNFI, the CFI, typically range between 0 and 1, with higher values closer to 1 indicating a better fit. With other indices, such as the RMSEA and the SRMR, smaller values closer to 0 indicate a better fit. Parsimonious fit indices. Some of the following indices merely reflect goodness of fit displayed by the theoretical model. Other indices reflect goodness of fit, but also reward models for being more parsimonious. A parsimonious model is a simpler model. What we're going to see is that you can always get a good fit between model and data as long as you're willing to make your model super complex. It is ideal that you have a theoretical model that accounts for the relationships while being relatively simple. That means while being relatively parsimonious. Parsimonious fit indices reflect goodness of fit between model and data, but also take into account the complexity of the model and reward models for being less complex. Simpler theoretical models are generally preferred if they do equally good job of accounting the, for the data, as do complex models. 
We go to page 16. The heading is Widely Used Global Fit Indices. We go to page 17. We start talking about these global fit indices. Now, by the way, uh, don't panic if you have a bunch of abbreviations coming at you all at once. Toward the end of this section, I'll give you a table that summarizes the most important indices for you to worry about and even provides criteria that you'll use in deciding whether a given model displays adequate fit to the data. But global fit indices, an important one is the RMSEA. Abbreviation RMSEA stands for Root Mean Square Error of Approximation. The RMSEA is very widely reported, possibly because it's a parsimonious fit index. With the RMSEA, smaller values closer to zero indicate a better fit between model and data. The SRMR, abbreviation SRMR, stands for Standardized Root Mean, Root mean Square Residual. With this index, once again, smaller values closer to zero indicate better fit between model and data. The CFI and PCFI. The abbreviation CFI stands for Compared to Fit Index. Compared to the NFI, which I kind of skipped over, CFI tends to be less biased than small samples. Values of the CFI can range from 0 to 1.0. Higher values reflect a better fit between model and data. The NNFI, sometimes called the TLI, abbreviation NNFI stands for Non-Normed Fit Index. Same statistic is also called the Tucker-Lewis Index, abbreviated as TLI. With the NNFI, higher values indicate a better fit. As promised, summary of criteria for evaluating global fit indices. For better or for worse, many articles describing a path analysis report a multitude of different global fit indices. Regarding this practice of overwhelming the reader with so many indices, McDonald and Ho observe, it's sometimes suggested that we should report a large number of these indices, apparently because we do not know how to use any of them. To make this task more manageable, Table 16.1 summarizes most global fit indices, most of the global fit indices just described. For each index, the table also presents criterion for an acceptable fit as recommended by Hu and Bentler and Mueller and Hancock. As promised, we are on page 19, looking at table 16.1. Widely used global fit indices and criteria for an acceptable fit. I'm not going to go over all of these, but you can see the big picture is this. It lists some important global fit indices, such as the RMSEA, and it indicates what size this fit index should show in your analysis for you to consider it an acceptable fit. Uh, with the RMSEA, you might have an acceptable fit if the this RMSEA statistic is less than or equal to 0 0.06. Skip down to the NFI. You might have an acceptable fit if the NFI is equal to or greater than 0 0.90 and so forth. Uh, you will use this table in exercise, upcoming exercise, in which you'll interpret results from a path analysis with manifest variables. I am still on page 19. Global fit indices obtained for the current analysis. Table 16.2 presents goodness of fit indices obtained from the path analysis. It presents these results for four different models. First, the null model. Yeah, the null model is a model in which all the variables are uncorrelated. This model merely serves as a baseline against which the three theoretical models can be compared. There it is, table 16.2. Now, we're finally getting away from the theoretical stuff. We're looking at the results that Dr. O'Day actually obtained when she performed her path analysis. Table 16.2, path analysis results uh, fit indices for a null model and three theoretical path models. Null model is the model in which no variable is allowed to correlate with any other variable. It is used as a baseline against which we'll compare the other models. Model 1 was Dr. O'Day's initial model, the one that consisted of just the solid line arrows. 
Here we see the statistics for Model 1. Model 2 was the same as Model 1, except we added an additional path. And Model 3 is the same as Model 2, except we added an additional path. Now, I'm not going to go over each of these statistics. You can review them if you like. Let's skip down to Dr. O'Day's evaluation. I am still on page 20. Page 20 below the table, Dr. O'Day says... Table 16.2 shows that of the three, three theoretical models being compared, only Model 3 displays an acceptable fit to the data. What is she talking about? Going back to the table. This is Model 3. It was the most complex of the tables. It was the one that included the solid line arrows, the one dashed line arrow, and also the dotted line arrow. Some of the statistics, the SRMR, smaller values of this are better. That's a small value, pretty close to zero. Same thing is true with the RMSEA. That's a relatively small value, close to zero. That means a good fit. NFI, higher values, closer to 1.0, indicate a good fit. And sure enough, we have a big value of 0.97. The other statistics can be interpreted in the same way. Of the three models being compared, only Model 3 displays an acceptable fit to the data. Uh, our next topic is going to be a statistical procedure that we use in evaluating models, uh, determining whether adding new paths results in statistically significant improvements in models fit. Uh, the topic is going to be the chi-square difference test, and we will cover that in the next part. Uh, this is the end of part three. We'll pick up the chi-square difference test when we get to part four.